three, and the anchor savings and loan building and parking ramp replaced the centuries-old Bliad and Atwood buildings in 1964. But the decade's most important parcels are not on the square, but seven blocks to the west and southwest. On either side of West Dayton Street, which is marked here in red, red west, both those photos, the street in red is West Dayton Street. To the north, the southeast dormitory expansion area. To the south, the Triangle and Brittingham urban renewal areas. We had two generation-defining developments going on at the same time, literally across the tracks from one another. Now, when city planners looked at this part of the Greenbush neighborhood in the late 1950s, they did not see a close-knit, intergenerational neighborhood of immigrant Italians and Jews and uh, African Americans that had been there for 60 years. It's just seven blocks from the Capitol, but it's on the wrong side of the tracks. All they saw, all the planners saw, was inadequate infrastructure and incompatible uses and all of it built on landfill. And all along, they wanted to tear it all down and starting in 1962, the Madison Redevelopment Authority did. By late 1962, the neighborhood is mainly a memory. And the tragedy of the Triangle gets even worse as the Redevelopment Authority adds injury to insult. First, because federal regulations did not include the in the appraisal loss of rental income or inconvenience to an unwilling seller, the Redevelopment Authority pays about a million dollars less for the property it takes than the city and the university would have paid for the same property under their rules. And the neighbors know that they are not getting a fair deal. And then, when the residents look for relocation, the authority overpromises and underperforms. Madison won't provide any public housing for the people whose private homes the redevelopment authority took until three years after the neighborhood is raised. And because housing discrimination is still legal before the Fair Housing Code of 1963, non-whites needing to move had access to only about 20% of the housing throughout the city. I will say that again. Before the Fair Housing Code of 1963, non-whites in Madison had access to 20% of the housing stock. You can, I've got the federal form in the book that shows housing units available, housing units for non-whites. It was on the pre-printed federal form. That was during our lifetime. And most of the units that non-whites could live in were in South Madison, which itself was about to be redeveloped. So seven years later, this is 1967, a medical clinic where St. Joseph's Church once stood, 60 units of public housing, the Gay Braxton Apartments for the Elderly, and 150 units of market rate apartments. That's it. Now, back on the other side of the tracks, on the other side of Dayton Street, June 1960, about the time the Regents adopt the Southeast Dormitory Expansion Plan. Three sets of twin towers housing 3,260 students. As enrollment doubles to 36,000, the university grows by tearing down 400 privately owned structures, seriously damaging town-gown relations years before anti-war protest does. And this is something that I did not realize until I was deep into the research. It wasn't the kids that pissed off Madison, it was the adults, it was the administrators and the regents who were acquiring the property and causing the first rift. And the backlash to university expansionism is so strong that when the university partners with the Redevelopment Authority on its own urban renewal uh, campus plan, it prompts a referendum that comes within 367 votes out of 37,000 cast at abolishing the Redevelopment Authority and ending urban renewal entirely. This photo from 1965 shows why the south side of the 700 and 800 blocks of University Avenue had more development potential than any two blocks in the city. Being between 3,000 students and their campus is going to be good for business. And as the university seeks to maximize its profit, 
More fights over rights to that land develop and create new crises between the city and the university. 1969, Lorenzo's and Paisans are gone. Three Bells is about to go. Uh, the Vilas Communications Hall is on its way. <coughs> Humanities has just opened. The Art Center will do so the following fall. Helen C. White under construction. Now I'm going to tell you the story in a couple minutes of the auditorium in the 60s. This is Frank Lloyd Wright's final rendering of the Monona Terrace Civic Auditorium, finished seven weeks before his death. As the decade dawned, Madison believed it was going to build this. Now by this time, conservative businessmen and politicians who hated Frank Lloyd Wright or hated the Law Park location had already delayed the project for two years. But in early 1961, the liberal pro Monona Terrace mayor, Ivan Nestigan, is about to be re-elected without opposition, uh, and the project finally goes out to bid. But the bids come in too high, Nestigan suddenly quits to become Undersecretary of Health, Education, and Welfare in the Kennedy administration. Henry Reynolds is elected on a platform of killing Monona Terrace, and he does by referendum in 1962. Here is that law park site where the terracites want to build, an unpaved lakefront parking lot. <laughs> and to know precisely what time this place is, you can see the Park Hotel has recently been uh, gutted and raised, and as I say, it will reopen as the Park Motor Inn in 1963. Now Paul made some comments about democracy, and this is very relevant. A word about the amazing level of civic engagement of the time. In October 1960, there was a city council public hearing on whether to have that referendum to kill Monona Terrace. It was held in the basement of the Central, Central High, uh, and a thousand people attended to sit for six hours listening to a public hearing. A thousand people in a city of 126,000 to listen to a public hearing. We have doubled in size. That is the equivalent today of having a public hearing in the Overture Hall and filling it to capacity. The level of civic engagement, and one of the reasons why Paul and others were in the streets in the 60s was because Paul and others in the early days couldn't vote in the 60s. The adults went to public hearings, public meetings, and voted. <clears throat> Students had to be in the streets. But the level of public engagement, the civic engagement, is really staggering uh, to contemplate. By 1967, we have a new mayor, and Wright's son-in-law, William Wesley Peters, offers this similar but updated design, a large auditorium, a small theater, an exhibition hall with banquet space. It is essentially Overture Hall, the Capitol Theater, and 45% of the current Monona Terrace. If this had been built, those wouldn't have been. And even though the people who killed Monona Terrace and, Monona, and, and this plan did so for bad reasons, one could argue it had a beneficial result because now we have better buildings. Uh, this plan is just part of Peter's grandiose Monona Basin plan. It is stretching from a cultural complex and boat launch at Olin Park to a marina and community center at the end of King Street. It is a staggering statement of architectural ambition. It is John Norman's grand esplanade on steroids. National publications gush, and the city council approves this master plan only eight weeks after it is introduced. Wait to see how quickly they do the next thing. <laughs> William Wesley Peters shows this auditorium design on September 9th, the very next day. After one 15-minute presentation, the council approves this drawing, 14 to 7, and directs Peters to prepare construction plans. One day's consideration, a 15-minute presentation, and they say, Let's go to bid. As 1968 ends, the city expects to break ground in 1969 with a grand opening in the fall of 1970. Spoiler alert. <laughs> but speaking of theaters, this may or may not look familiar. 
It's that lobby out there. You see the doors? You see where the snack bar is? You're putting it together? Uh, Mayor Otto Feske and officials from the 20th Century Theater at the opening of the former Eastwood Theater, now the Sleek Cinema Theater. A quarter million dollar remodel has replaced the faux Spanish stucco from 1929 with walnut and white panels, blue carpets, and a brass and glass chandelier. A trivia note, the theater's first film is John Huston's The Bible. I guess they were playing to the demographics. Um, that is popular Orpheum Theater manager Jerry Flayden to uh, Otto Feske's left. Now this was a very risky investment back then because the sassy neighborhood was not in good shape. A city report in 1964 called the Atwood Avenue Business District an area of quote, old deteriorating structures and traffic congestion that offers a depressing and unexciting appearance for it is unplanned, inconvenient, and unattractive in mixed use. This is this neighborhood we are talking about. By the spring of 1966, there were 15 vacant storefronts in the nine blocks from Winnebago Street to Fair Oaks Avenue. 14,000 cars a day came up that one block of Winnebago and turned right on Atwood. 14,000 cars a day, and they're commuters, they're not shoppers. So that's why the Atwood Business District is atrophying. The, the report says there is, quote, a declining community spirit, especially among the young people living and working in the area, evidenced by a lack of local focus. And the planners have a solution. A 40,000 square foot shopping center featuring a full service supermarket and chain drugstore in the area between Ameth Court almost to First Street. Maybe this will help you visualize it better. The area in red was proposed by the city planners as a 40,000 square foot shopping center. And for a more pedestrian environment, pedestrian friendly environment, the consultants propose a new road aligned with the railroad tracks from First Street to Division Street uh, to divert traffic headed for Monona. You know it as Eastwood Avenue, as, as the bypass. And, oh, and the, re the report also says that the venerable Eastside Businessmen's Association has become, quote, too diffused to be effective in promoting the area's revitalization and calls for a new nonprofit corporation to be created to acquire and develop property. The shopping center is thankfully never built, but the neighborhood saving Eastwood Bypass is, and the Shanks Avenue Revitalization Association forms. Now, just as Opening a new road helped save the Atwood Business District. Closing a road helped save the residential neighborhood along Third Ridge. 7,000 cars a day were going down Spade Street until David Mollenhoff and the Wilmar Neighborhood Association proposed banning left turns onto Oak Ridge and Lakeland and putting a cul-de-sac at the west end of Jennifer. As the decade ended, the city agreed, and it has been that way ever since. That is, why this, that is why that neighborhood has been saved, because the Neighborhood Association proposed a traffic uh, management, and the city said, that's a good idea, let's do that. I think the juxtaposition of these two images really captures a lot about the decade. Twice a crowd of 10,000 came to mourn a martyr in the shadow of another. The state's official memorial service for President Kennedy is somber and subdued. The campus memorial for Martin Luther King, run by a group of black students, is angry and bitter, and followed by a massive march up State Street. There are three 50th anniversaries coming up in, 19, in 2019 that I think you should be ready for, so I'm gonna close with um, these three items because Madison really ended the decade at full speed. Paul mentioned the Black Strike of 1969. The climactic and most successful protest of the decade, the Black Strike in February 1969, brings 10 days of disruption, an hour of disruption, and the creation of the Black Studies Department. 
Black students issued 13 demands, including an autonomous black studies department, controlled and organized by black students and faculty, with a black chairman approved by black students, and black students having veto power over staffing decisions. They issue these demands, and white students stand in the schoolhouse door and help achieve many of them. As I say, it was the most successful protest of the decade because it accomplished the single most important thing it was after, the establishment of a black studies department and a black studies program. Now, that was the good part, um, but they only accomplished that after another historic first. National Guardsmen called to campus, 2,000 strong. They keep the streets and buildings open, but their presence prompts increased participation in the strike and brings new attacks on the university, especially on Fred Harvey Harrington, by Republican legislators. And for all the attacks that the current group of yahoos in, in the big white building with the gold lady on top are, are leveling at the other end of, of State Street, it pales in comparison to the attacks that were made on the student body and on the administration and regions of the 1960s. Uh, it will really curl your hair, those of you who still have hair, uh, to, to see um, what they were attempting to do. So that's uh, one of the stories. Invitation to a block party from Tom Simon and the International Werewolf Conspiracy. It's spring, and the hippies and the heavies just want to get high and dance in the street, and it doesn't really matter to them that they don't have a permit. Um, now this is a week before the People's Park incident in Berkeley. It is almost two months before the Stonewall riot in New York, in Greenwich Village. The, uh, this illegal block party becomes the first lifestyle riot of the era. And I think it's the first urban riot of the decade that isn't an anti-civil rights riot. There were, there were, civil, there were white civil rights, white riots in the South in the 60s, but those were um, against civil rights. This is the first uh, lifestyle riot and the first urban riot of, of the decade. 512 West Mifflin, Ground Zero, where Police Inspector Herman Thomas told Allison Claremont to turn down the music. It did not go well. Uh, <laughs> she hollers, get a permit, he goes out, he gets enforcements. Paul told me that when he came back to the enforcements, he told uh, the rest of the officers, follow me men, we're going down there to crack some heads. And Herman Thomas issues the orders to keep the streets clear. The growing crowd responds with rocks and bottles and vulgar catcalls. And someone even tosses a roasted pig's head at the squad car. <laughs> we were creative back then, weren't we? <laughs> Enough of this nonsense, Thomas says, and releases his men to disperse the crowd, as he says, quote, in whatever manner they saw fit. And officers who had taken a beating at Dow, and they took a beating at Dow, and, it, and they remembered it. And the officers who had generally been restrained during the black strike do not hold back. They are charging groups and individuals with nightsticks up. They are drawing blood. They are sometimes drawing their service revolvers and they pump massive amounts of tear gas, including into Harvey Goldberg's apartment at 521 West Dayton Street. Affinity groups fight back, showering the cops with bricks and bottles, often in coordinated attacks and ambushes. Some young socialists liberate a flatbed truck to serve as a Parisian-style barricade, and they launch volleys of rocks and bricks on the cops, who are twice driven back before they finally overwhelm the rampart. Set much, much of the same on Sunday, including Paul's second arrest. And as a historical note, his $507 bail is paid by Firefighters Local 311 at the direction of Union President and Fire Captain Ed Durkin. And here's another way you know Madison is unique. When Ed Durkin was Captain Ed Durkin and President of Firefighters Local 311, he took the union out first on an illegal sick out, and then on an illegal strike. He took the firefighters out on two illegal strikes. What did we do? We made him chief. <laughs> and here is Mayor Bill Dyke, who's only been in office two weeks at this time. 
He comes to the new Mifflin Co-op on Monday evening. It's still so new. It still has the uh, white front sign out in front. Um, but his appearance is counterproductive. The Monday night fight is the worst yet. Peace, police blanket the area from Langdon Street to the southeast dorms with so much tear gas, they run out and they try to scatter students by just throwing soda cans at them. <laughs> students fight back again with bricks and bottles, but this time they also firebomb three city, state, and university offices. And one of the things that I think will shock people and who did not live through it is, is, the, is the level of just low-level ongoing violence firebombing, trashing, breaking the, breaking the windows, setting fires here, setting fires there, it, you know, occupying offices. It really was a remarkable period, and if this level of disruption happened again today, I'm a bit scared of, of what level the response would be. Um, so the students firebomb a couple of offices, and at 10 o'clock, for the second May in three years, the Teamster bus drivers say, hey, we're not, we're, no, we're, and, the, and the students shut down the bus system again. Some of you may remember Roundy Coughlin. Roundy had these columns which were sort of idiosyncratic. His comment, and remember at this time the football team is 0-19-1. And, <laughs> and Roundy on the third day of the Mifflin Block Party riots writes, if the football team could get a march on like a lot of them students did Sunday night, they would go to the Rose Bowl. <laughs> you saw earlier that 350 protested at the first uh, anti-war demonstration in October 1963. Six years to the week later, in October 15th, uh, uh, 1969, 15,000 filled the field house as Madison marked the moratorium. Among the speakers, Jim Rowan, who in 1973 would become Mayor Sodlin's top assistant. It was Jim Rowan who exposed the military university complex, especially the activities of the Army Math Research Center. Then they marched to the Capitol in the cold rain to read the names of the dead. The war went on. 33 Madison men died in Vietnam in the 1960s. Ten had gone to West High, six apiece at Central and East. Two were UW graduates, including Army Lieutenant Harry B. Hamilton III, 24, recipient of three Purple Hearts, a presidential citation, the Army Commendation Medal for Heroism, the Bronze Star for Valor, and several other commendations. He was a 1967 university graduate through the ROTC program. He dies after a mortar attack. <laughs> Specialist for Bernard Mazursky was in the class of 1970, but he gave up his deferment and enlisted along with his best friend in December 1966. He's killed in an ambush on May 4th, 1968. The second night of the Mifflin riot is his yard site and the son of the head of the Madison Draft Board also enlisted to protect his father from whispers and accusations of favoritism. His jeep struck a landmine. He didn't make it. May all their memories be for a blessing. I wanted to end on a nice romantic image of Madison. I can't, decide, can't choose between this one State Street, 1965. And this one, Boxing Day, 1966. That's the program. I thank you so much for coming. It has been such a meaningful experience to me to work on this book. And I, I thank you all for being here. Uh, 
anybody with questions, comments, request more pizza? Anything? Yeah. Oh, when you were talking about the creation of the Black Studies program, you said, one of the things that the students were looking for was the Oh, well, the, the students the, the students get it, did not get everything they asked for in 1969. The students, and actually you would have seen in, in Paul's campaign statement, student control of curriculum and, and faculty was, was an ongoing um, issue for student, uh, student power. They, they, they never had control, they never had operational control. They never were able to um, select faculty or... But they did establish the program, which, which was a big deal. Anybody? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, would you be willing to give a weekly author talk to the seniors at the Goodman Community Center? Of course. Um, do you have a card that you can give me? We'll talk afterwards. I'll, I'll go anywhere and talk to anybody. I'd like to speak to you all. Yeah, anybody who wants to. Uh, Kristen Gilpatrick, who uh, you saw earlier, is, is the marketing and publicity person at the press. And, and we'll go anywhere and, and talk to anybody. Um, I love sharing these stories. Uh, anybody, anybody? Jeff Olson. Yeah, yeah. You should do this exact same thing again here. Your books are all sold out and the place is full. <laughs> Your lips to God's here. Yeah. Yeah, can you talk about the influence of the late 60s? into the early 70s? I realize it's about one decade, but how did this influence the early 70s? You know, I, I adopted really early on that my focus was 1160 to 123169, because even when you're writing about the era of sex, drugs, and rock and roll, you have to have limits. <laughs> <laughs> and and I, I really, I couldn't tell you what happened on January. I know what happened on February 14, 1970, because that's the day they tore down Mapleside. But I really <laughs> fixed on the book ends 12:31:69, and I can't. I, I I cannot give you a meaningful answer uh, on how it influenced. Um, I guess I'll have to write another book. Sure. <laughs> It's all good. It's all good. Thank you. It's all good. Yeah. yeah what was the impact of um, this very young violence in action on preservation? Well, it, very little. It, it, was, it was the tearing down of Mapleside. The, and, and, and here's another example of how someone we identify as a conservative mayor did something that I think is pretty progressive. Bill Dyke is the father of the Historic Preservation Ordinance and the Landmarks Commission because when they were proposing to tear down Mapleside, the Capital Times started this publicity campaign, you know, send postcards to Mayor Dyke and get him to stop tearing, to prevent this. And, you know, he couldn't stop it, but he sends all these cards down to the planning department and says, hey, let's have a historic preservation ordinance. So it was Mapleside that really, um, elect, that, that really focused uh, the, the preservation community on the loss of our architectural history. There was a group called Te Chopra, which had formed prior to Mapleside being threatened, but it was Mapleside more than the Vilas Mansion. Back what surprised there? you the most? What surprised me the most? Well, um, the, a couple of things. The level of um, so the level of civic engagement in the early '60s, the level of just daily violence and disorder in '68, '69, the level of racial antagonism in 1968, and for and for all the racial problems we have in the city today. If you remember 1968, if you remember the Bree Stevens incident, where it's practically, where there are racial fights, where there are so many racial fights between white kids and black kids at these teen dances, these wisdom teen dances at the Eastside Businessmen's Association Club, that the police chief in Monona shuts them down because these fights are spilling up and down Atwood Avenue and Monona Drive. The black football players boycott the teen banquet in 1968, and a very popular white football coach 
quits and calls them all terrorists and says they should be kicked off the team. The, the, the level of racial antagonism, and this is in a day when there are no black police officers. The first black cop is hired in 1969, and it will not surprise you to learn that it was Johnny Winston's father. Johnny Winston Sr. was the first African American on the Madison Police Force. His son, of course, is Lieutenant Johnny Winston of the Madison Fire Department. So, so the level of, of racial anger and antagonism, the, 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 the level of ongoing disruption, um, the, the level of antagonism between Henry Reynolds and the Common Council, and for all the grief the Council gives you, they never censured you the way they censured Henry Reynolds. Uh, you're working on it. <laughs> uh, so so uh, those are some of the things. The, the, it wasn't so much a surprise, but it was a delight to read the high level of journalism of the day. And, you know, I started the research by reading every day's newspaper from front to back for the entire decade. That's the State Journal, the Cap Times, and the Daily Cardinal for 10 years. Um, and then it would go to the archives and, and so on. But the level of journalism, and the quality, and the depth, and, and the extent of the stories, no one will be able to write this book about this decade because all the news is blog posts and tweets. So the, the quality and the, and the extent of journalism was also a surprise and a delight. Yeah. Winston, Winston was, was hired, as Stewart said, in 1969. I can't remember if it was 71 or 1972. I think it was 1971. Uh, he's the only African-American police officer in the department. And they are showing a training film on how to handle riots. And in the darkened uh, auditorium where they're showing the film, a voice shouts out and makes a comment using a, a racial term that is totally unacceptable then, uh, less even less acceptable now. Uh, no one in the police department administration does anything about it. And so Winston um, submits his resignation. And that ends his career for the time being with the police department. When Dave Cooper was hired as chief in uh, the late fall of 1972, one of the first things he does is he seeks out uh, Johnny Winston Sr. and persuades him to come back to the Madison Police Department. I guess I'm a good note for the second edition. Thank you for that. <laughs> yes. And they would say, oh, we should take all the N-word people 